Jimmy are on the record, and I'm uh, calling to order the Grandview Heights Parks and Rec Public Facilities Committee uh, present this evening. Uh, members of the committee, myself, and Melanie Houston. Hopefully, Ed will be arriving shortly. Uh, we have one item on the agenda, and it is to revisit the uh, parks rules established in 1976. Um, the, general, uh, the general purpose of this revisit is to effectively non-codify to, to a point uh, some of this from a council perspective and turn it over to the um, administrative uh, functions of the city to update and maintain these rules as needed in response to a, a number of changes, obviously, that have occurred both in the parks and in uh, in the city since uh, 1976. Mike, do you have any um, anything to open up with in terms of uh, any high priority items that have uh, created this necessity for the revisit? Um, a couple of the, the main points that were modified uh, or uh, updated was uh, the, the gun control um, ordinances that have been modified since 1976 uh, as it becomes a sealed carry uh, items. Uh, and then there's also some modifications to uh, private business usage within parks. Uh, we saw a big uptick of that with uh, COVID uh, and, and people moving out to parks and, and trying to conduct business on public land. So. Thank you. Um, regarding that uh, that specific section, section H of the uh, of the rules set uh, rules and regulations uh, that we've been distributed, what um, do you have any comparisons to other local communities that uh, that have similar rules or regs for uh, for that? Uh, let's call it commercial use. Um, there's a number of uh, communities in Central Ohio. Uh, the city of Columbus has a number of private contractors who use a number of their facilities, host tournaments, um, charge admission, parking, stuff like that. So um, they were one of the bigger ones that had an example. Um, Upper Island and Bexley have similar type things. So. And they, so when you speak to the similarities between uh, what you have drafted here for us to consider and uh, specifically maybe Bexley and Upper Arlington. Do they have um, this shared fee or percentage of fee that is to be paid to uh, to the uh, municipality? It's pretty common, yes. Okay. And do you have any indication of what that fee structure is like? We're just seeing a blank. It's typically a 20 or 30 percent uh, profit. Of profit or revenue? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, so is that something uh, I'm sure we'll have a, another opportunity to kind of go through this and take, um, and take other input, but I wanted to learn kind of what the, the high priorities are from, from you as the parks director. Uh, has that, I know that was a topic of a more casual conversation in past years, but that had not really been set into uh, in the policy. Has there been an increase, decrease, other than what you mentioned regarding the pandemic period? Um, it, it, it's, it's, and it's not, let me reiterate, it's not necessarily uh, exclusive to fitness. Um, we have uh, a very nice batting base that folks have tried to put batting clinics in there without permission. Very nice tennis courts. Uh, private instructors try to host clinics and camps down there without permission. Um, so there's a number of things. Uh, there's been requests for uh, full usage by private vendors to hold activity classes. Um, this space back here as well. So variety of examples. Okay. Um, just business. Okay. Um, the uh, hours reflected uh, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Is there any consideration or need to uh, adjust those seasonally? Your thoughts? Uh, not, not from my standpoint, but maybe uh, 
police might have a, a different opinion, but uh, we do make some modifications to uh, facility to access restrooms, stuff like that. Uh, when time change occurs, we usually shorten the day of accessibility during those times to uh, 8 p.m. instead of 10 p.m. What is the uh, what is the process in place, if any, uh, if a if a group is having a specific event or or a uh, whether it's an exclusive reservation or non-exclusive reservation, how are these rules distributed to the groups? Um, typically, uh, that primarily only occurs uh, at times at Winewood Shelter. Um, there is a time extension that has to be approved. Um, by either the director and or the mayor. Um, any special events go through a special permitting process that are required to uh, provide start and end times. So review of that is done in that process. Um, and any 10 p.m. is lifted as necessary for those. Okay. Um, this, the, uh, the, the recreational groups that uh, are in use or that, that we see commonly for softball, baseball, soccer, any other youth or potentially adult activities, are they, um, uh, is this same set of rules distributed to them? Yeah, and they sign, uh, each private group signs a user agreement that uh, denotes all the, all the rules and regulations they can follow. Um, and then the rules are readily available on our website as well too. So. Okay. Have we received any input at all from any of those organizations as to potential modifications, requests, or deletions? Um, myself and the school uh, talked uh, a little bit with modified uh, firearms because we have a user agreement with the school district as well since they share facilities more or less. Um, but the, the private groups don't tend to bring up too many topics for the rules. Okay. <clears throat> um, Thank you. Appreciate all of that. Uh, Melanie, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about the posting of rules in the park, kind of the vision for that. I'm not aware of a lot of, um, I guess the shelters are one place, but uh, in terms of board, you know, physical locations in our park, um, are these little can be posted? I can't think of any top of mind. And then I have two other questions after that, but I'm going to pause there. Thank you, Melanie. Mike, go ahead. Uh, so one of the goals uh, with this update is to uh, provide some signage, some new signage in parks, uh, so that people uh, know that these rules do exist. Um, they'll likely be uh, somewhat generic in nature, but uh, with some additional information on how to obtain the full list of rules uh, easily. All right, thank you. Um, and then okay. Go ahead, Melanie, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, and, and then regarding the breaking of the language related to um, firearms, can you speak um, to, uh, are we going to continue to prohibit that then at the regulatory level, if it's taking this as will be addressed in our um, city code, will we maintain that um, prohibition on firearms in our local parks? Melanie, I'm going to uh, to ask the city attorney to reflect on that question. Great, thank you. Sure, so there are a couple of uh, different things at issue here. <clears throat> Excuse me. One is that uh, we have a user agreement with the school that constitutes basically an extension of, of school property. Uh, it's a lease agreement uh, for use of certain facilities. Um, the second is there's a federal law that uh, has some protections in it for uh, places that, that would include parks that are within a certain distance of uh, a school. Um, and uh, so there are, there are some gray areas about uh, where Firearms might not be restrictable, if you will. Um, so it, it's a balancing act. It's, it's very difficult to have one size fits all, which was really one of the reasons that we had to look at modifying this and deferring to administrative rules and regulations that could be updated more nimbly. Um, but 
for, for the time being, most of the uh, parks and facilities that we have fall within one of those two exceptions, those being subject to the lease agreement with the schools or within a certain vicinity of the school. Okay, um, that's helpful. So clarifying question, are you suggesting that there have been recent, the, as a care there have been recent updates to federal law, which might pre prevent us or preempt us from having a restriction on firearms in our local park? It's not a recent law. It's been around for quite some time, the federal law. I think it's a
parks aren't monitored and people don't expect to go and you know have a monitor on their child. So from a safety standpoint, I think uh, it's probably best that we leave that provision in. Okay. I think it's something to think a little bit on and, and perhaps that work is done. I just I know that I have witnessed children, especially at part of Piercefield, you know, hiding in, in trees. Um, so I don't know. To me if we're gonna have the language in the code and it's prohibited but we're turning up blind eye to it, it's it's not very clear to our community members. Thank you, Melanie. Um, I would like to uh, continue that conversation as well. Um, this being in our second reading and first hearing by the committee, we will uh, defer further conversation on this until our next committee meeting, and uh, we'll, we'll take a closer look at the items that you have addressed uh, concerns for. With that, so with that, I will adjourn our uh, Parks and Rec Committee meeting in seven weeks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.
Patsofatinos here. Houston. Here. And Sarah. Here. Smith. Here. President Keeler. Here. Mayor Kearns. Here. Director Dvorsky. Here. City Attorney Kusayam. Here. Director Miller. Here. All are present. You next we'll move to the approval of approval of proceedings with the regular meeting April 5th, 2021. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 already proved herself in a short amount of time that she is very valuable to us. So we're glad to have her. Congratulations. Rapid 5 
is a regional system. And, and so we have a great baseline here in the region with our parks. Um, so this opportunity that we have to connect all of our um, waterways in the region. So there's five corridors, um, which you'll see in a slide here shortly, but Big Darby, Allen Creek, Scioto, Olin TNG, and um, the Big Walnut Corridor. And so it came to our leadership that we have all of these great, amazing parks in the region that are kind of happening, happening in isolation. So if you look at the downtown riverfront to Cory Trails Metro Park that's getting ready to open up all the way up to Dublin, all these great efforts are happening. How can we connect them? Um, and how do we connect the region and redefine the region along our waterways? We can go to the next slide. Let's see if it will advance here. I think it's zoomed in a little bit. That's the slide we were just on. Yep, there we go. So this is this is our baseline of, of what we have today. Um, we have 146 miles of waterways. And Again, great baseline, but if you look at a map that I'm going to show you here shortly, it's not equitable. Um, so the parks have been, in, this, in the COVID world, it's been the only piece of social infrastructure our community has had, has had access to. Um, so it's been a really big bright spot for a lot of folks, but not everybody can drive up to High Banks Metro Park um, as well. So equity is a large component for this. Um, if we can go to the next slide. We can. So we talked about about population growth. So we're growing and we have this huge opportunity to connect our region. There's, you know, 146 miles of waterways doesn't exist in anywhere in the country. And the unique opportunity, even more unique, is that 87% of at least one side of every waterway is publicly owned. That's huge. There's not any acquisition. It's this, we have not found a system that is, um, equal to this, there, so it's, it's really unparalleled. And so we're talking about, you know, our organizations talk about growth in the region, and so access to parks, as I mentioned earlier, is not equitable. And as we start to grow and, and have more population, it's, it's gonna be an issue as we move into the future. And these are pre-COVID numbers, um, so we know things have kind of changed here recently with our population projections, um, but still very top of mind of how, how we make sure everyone has access. Uh, next slide, please. So we have embarked on a vision. Right now we're in the community engagement piece. Um, so we're out talking with the community. Uh, we have a website called rapid5.org and it takes you right to our social engagement um, website and it's unique doing social engagement in a virtual world. I haven't done that before. Um, but it's, it's been really positive. We've had a lot of outreach um, and, and engagement so far. So these are the five um, considerations that a lot of the comments are organized around. And then we, um, we have hired five design firms, and, and P. Liz is, is familiar with, with the teams, and, and we've talked to Mayor Kearns about it. Each design firm is assigned a corridor. Um, so these, these considerations are really important, and really the priorities of what the design firms are thinking about throughout this process. And social equity is, is definitely a top priority for this entire effort. Uh, next slide, please. And so as I mentioned, the impact of parks and, and how it has an impact on people and our places. Um, so our social infrastructure actually can help expand the reach of the system that we're talking about in the vision. But then it's also, again, I mentioned it's the only piece of, our parks have been the only piece of social infrastructure that we've had access to as a community and a, a lot of communities across the region. And so the, those considerations have a huge impact on our places. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. So this is our system today. Um, again, a really great baseline. It, it might be hard to see for you guys, but the spots in green are any of our parks and our metro parks. The um, orange lines are our, exist, our existing trail system. So Morsi's engaged with us. City of Columbus and Coda are engaged as well. And this, you know, the, the layering of all of these great systems in our region is really important. So COG um, with Central Ohio Greenways is part of the trail planning and Link Us and Coda are part of the uh, mobility um, corridors as well. So that's a priority for us and our partners is to overlay those efforts. And we we feel that this is a direct com complement to those efforts as well. If you could go to the next slide. Oh, you jumped. Okay. There we go. So this is the plan system today. So it's really unique in Central Ohio. 
um, that we have equal access of all of our rivers and we can thank the glaciers for that. But, but this really helps fill in some of the holes that we have in our region and then this overlays the Cobden with the trails. Um, so one of the unique statistics as part of this, as this vision would come to fruition, is that every, and you can slide down to the next, the next, next one there, that every resident in Franklin County would be a mile and a half to an existing park or open space system. That's a huge statistic. Um, it's a very conservative statistic because it will actually be a lot less in certain areas. Um, but that is a huge impact that we don't have today. And if you go along regions like areas like Allen Creek, the access is inequitable. They can see the trail from their backyard, but they can't access it. Um, so really, really important statistic. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So our funders um, to date. So we have um, been fundraising since February. We have raised, um, we're, we're just shy of half a million dollars for the effort. The effort will fund um, all of the community engagement work that we're doing to date. It will also fund the, um, the design firms that we've hired to look at every corridor and all of the community outreach efforts and, and communications efforts. Um, I have not seen, I've been part of a lot of fundraising efforts around Insight 2050. I've never seen an idea catch fire like it has in the region. And the fact that almost every community is on that board is, is pretty amazing in our region. Um, it, our communities have come together for efforts like Insight 2050, but it's not very typical that you see that in regions. So I think that speaks volumes to, to Central Ohio. Um, and also from the private sector. We have companies that want to start firm, or, uh, funding next phases. So it's pretty amazing <laughs> in a COVID world to see the amount of fundraising that's happening with this and the excitement as well. If we could go to the next slide. And so these are just the, the firms that are part of our process. Neighborhood Design Center is the community engagement firm. Um, they have a lot of great contacts throughout the region and help to build our community engagement website. These are the design firms, um, our branding and, and public relations. Let me go to the next slide. So our timeline. So we, um, we stood up our community engagement website in March and that's been open um, to the public and will remain open even into the next phases of this project. And so the design firms um, have been given that they actually started today officially. Um, and so we will have um, them working until June 1st. So it's a very aggressive timeline to create a vision. Um, and, and so they're, they're going full steam ahead. They've actually met with um, members of, of the city of Grandview Heights and all of the communities around the region. And we have one more Friday, I believe, is the next one. And so after that, we will have a public release. And we're still trying to figure out what that looks like in a COVID world, um, but trying to find some creative options for both in person um, and online. And then we're also in a virtual roadshow. And this is the first presentation I've given in person, so I'm really excited about it. But we'll still continue to be out in the community um, talking about Rapid 5 and looking for engagement and ideas as well. Next slide, please. And the next slide is really going to take you to our, our social engagement um, toolkit. So there's a ton of activity that's happening, <coughs> ideas that are generating. So the design firms are really going to take these ideas and implement it into their, their vision that they plan to roll out. And we have this idea as well. And in a, on the next slide, we have a, um, a mapping tool. And the mapping tool is very interactive. You can draw. Um, I will say, let's see here, there's one comment in the Marble Cliff and Grandview Heights area. I don't know if it's here. Actually, we've got two. That must be a new one. Um, so we'd love to have your guys' support and talking about what you want as a community, asking the residents to participate. Um, a lot of communities, we have a social toolkit to share with your residents, um, and I believe that's been shared here as well. Um, so that's my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. made that request to, to Mayor Kearns. Um, so that is that is a request um, from both ULA Columbus and Wormsey. Um, the range of a commitment um, varies through um, municipalities. It ranges from 50,000, 25,000 to 10,000. Um, so we, you know, it's, it's also, a, it's a fundraising ask, but it's also your support as well um, for the project. That's probably the most important of the two asks.
and special project money, and then council has special project money as well. So if council's interested in using some of that money to put together with administration and dually support it, that would be one option. And if not, then the administration will probably just use all of their money. But it's something, the special project money of council doesn't always get, we don't always remember it. So this could be something you might want to use it for. Director Miller is 3,000 in that fund right now. Yeah. And it doesn't, you've already appropriated it. So if you were in favor of doing that, it would just, that's all we need. And we can just move forward and take care of it then administratively. Well, I think this is a great project. And it's something that our residents are very interested in. We have a lot of bikers and active folks in town. And keeping kind of close to things would be great. And I would move to appropriate, or not to appropriate, to fund $3,000 
that you could put out in your yard and then um, you can scan the code and it would take you right to the website and the link you needed to get registered to vote if you weren't already registered. So I ordered, I asked on the Grandview Facebook pages um, if people wanted these and then I took, got a count and I placed an order with them and distributed them. I got 25 and put them around Grandview. But I had asked because I was hoping to put them in the parks. Um, and the, uh, the answer was no. I had, was told that the, the, the thank you for the offer because I offered to pay for them, but the city wasn't interested. So I'm coming back to just ask because this is this fall will be another off cycle election. If you would reconsider, um, I would pay for them. I will put them out. I will take them back. And another piece in this is I know that City of Columbus, that I'm on the email list for the Columbus City Council. Um, and I saw that before last fall's election, they were emailing their constituents to try and get them excited about voting, get them information about voting to get them out to vote. So um, I just uh, have this as sort of a passion project to like getting more people involved in voting. Um, so that I, I did look back a few cycles. So like before, like the 2017, it might have been 31%, and then 2015 was in the high 30s. But just uh, something to put out there for you guys to think about to strengthen our democracy by asking for your help to reach out to constituents um, or let you put the signs up or send some emails or do some kind of promotion leading up to the election to get people out to vote. Um, and kind of tying in with the theme of the democracy, um, the meetings here I know have been structured so that it's public comment. So I can come and say something, but I can't have a dialogue with you. And when I email, I don't often get responses from people. And so it doesn't seem I feel like looking for it more democratic to have some strength in democracy to be able to have a conversation with the people who represent me in the city. Um, and I have seen a couple of examples. I am doing some research on this two years ago in Texas, of all places, I was very surprised to see this. They passed a bill into law. Um, HB 284 that makes it um, for any government meeting, you have to allow the, your constituents to speak throughout the meeting. They can speak at the beginning, and then any time there's going to be a vote, they can they put their hand up, and then you have to let them speak um, before a vote. And I actually saw this, uh, I don't know, in Columbus, any place besides Rexley. I sat in on a couple of their meetings in September. I know on September 22nd was one where they had this, um, and I had two of them right around that time that I saw this uh, set up there where they allow the people throughout the meeting to raise their hand and have a conversation. Um, um, a very friendly, like receptive, uh, just a different tone from, I know I come here and try to ask questions and the told it's just like a comment. Um, and so for these two things, I'm asking if you would consider changing that to have like strengthen the democracy, to make it more, I, I mean, I'm not really sure why the rule is in place. There are very few, whenever I come to these meetings, there are hardly any people waiting to speak. So it's not like you have a line of 20 people and I can see you would want to get through that quickly. So I would like to understand for both of these things, if you didn't want to help me and work on that, why? Um, and I don't know if you want to have a conversation here, if you could email me. But I, if you aren't interested, I, I would like to understand why. Um, and I have a third point, um, and I can wrap up and then we can talk about it if you'd like. But um, I happened today to be thinking that I had forgotten what the demographic breakdown was at Grandview. So I went out to look for that, and on the census website, um, the census.gov site, they have in there, they don't have the 2020 results yet for the demographics, but they did have a survey from 2019, and it has, I looked at 10 suburbs in Franklin County. Um, Grandview is the least diverse of those 10. It has 96.3% white people. Um, after that, the next closest after that is Grove City with 92%. Um, Worthington was after that, but uh, like Upper Arlington has 90%. And then at the other end, you have Columbus uh, with 58.5% uh, Caucasian, and um, even Dublin is at 74% Caucasian. 
So I know that you have on the agenda tonight that you are going to vote on a resolution, an anti-Asian hate resolution, and I know you voted on the um, declaring racism a public health crisis. And I would just ask that, I know you're voting for those things, but, but that you also take some action on those things just besides voting on a resolution, something that would create change in our community because left on its own, 96.3% Caucasian. I don't see that changing anytime soon. So that, those were the items I wanted to talk with you about and ask for your help with. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Appreciate it. Thank you. And in terms of the, considering letting people have a dialogue here, would you answer that? Or if you don't want to talk about that, you could send me an email or? Um, I would just say the rules haven't changed. They've just been put into the agenda that's sent out. So. Okay, but how can I get answers when people don't email me back? But there are some council members who have never returned an email. Sure. So I don't understand how I'm supposed to. I see people on the porches. I see people on the porches and stuff. We talk with some people and other people I've been in some meetings with. So I've had some conversations outside of here. But when the e emails don't get read or answered and you won't let me have a conversation here, that doesn't seem like a democracy. and resulting social distancing requirements have provided us with at least one silver lining, and that is an appreciation for the invaluable and replace, irreplaceable benefits associated with face-to-face -face human interaction. It's with that thought in mind that I urge Council and the Administration to capitalize on the momentum brought about by the reopening of our society and our government. Seize the moment by encouraging and nurturing resident involvement and meaningful citizen interaction during your meetings. Some of Council's best legislation has been a direct result of open and transparent exchanges of ideas between elected officials and Grandview residents. And by residents, I mean Council's and the Mayor's bosses. Many minds working together in an open and transparent forum will inevitably come up with better solutions than a small group with minimal input and minimal debate. I'm asking the city to put forth a more positive and welcoming tone in an effort to encourage a greater amount of resident participation in the process. Thank you so much. Good evening. 
good to be back standing in front of you in person. It's a welcome change. I'm going to take my mask off with that just a little bit so I can, my glasses will fall down so I can read. Um, fire department's been really busy. Uh, as from my department report, you can see we've got a lot of activities going on. A couple of the big things that I wanted to hit on were our runs and call for services are quickly adjusting back to the pre-COVID levels. Uh, as you can see in the one chart I submitted, in this same period, our runs are back up 76 runs compared to the same time period last year. Um, this is evident all over Central Ohio. More so than ever, the hospitals are starting to divert again, which means they're getting overrun, which are all things we've seen before the pre-COVID levels. So uh, we, we, have, we have been very busy adjusting back to that. Um, another big thing that I, I wanted to touch on that I was very proud on is our community paramedicine interaction we had. Um, and, and if you're not really familiar with community medicine, it's a, it's a pretty new and evolving uh, healthcare model. It allows the fire department and the medics to go out and personally serve underserved portions of that community. Um, Grandview has a, 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 a little population that we're, we're seeing based on frequent utilizers of our service of the elderly population. And it's some of the elder, elderly population that wants to stay at home with their families. So we, we see this as an opportunity to listen to those needs, to customize an at-home kind of service for them to allow them to, re, to keep their goals of staying at home with their family. A lot of people, uh, when they're discharged, they get discharge instructions, they get medicines, they get therapy recommendations, and sometimes they get home and they don't keep up with those. They're not able to keep up with those. They need help with transportation to those. So that's an opportunity for us to serve our residents. Um, one of our most recent successful examples was a resident that utilized the 911 system nine times in over 10 weeks. These calls for service were falls, medical alarms, and basically just general assistance calls. So we've got a, a, we, we've got a procedure that when our medic crews go out and they see someone that needs something that they're not getting from just going to the hospital. They can go to the hospital, they can get discharged, but if they don't have the family support, the ability to meet those discharge instructions, those medicines, those therapy evaluations, um, they're gonna end up bouncing back and going right back where they were. So th this resident was targeted by our medic crews. We sent our community paramedic, um, Mike Smith, out to them, um, and he evaluated them. He got with her family, her power of attorneys, and all her extended family, and got a really good evaluation of the system. Found out what the, what the family dynamic was and what was going on. Mike went right into action. He tailored a response. He was able to get with the staff at OSU, and since we're the EMS provider, we have access to those, those, those records, hospital records. Found out what her discharge instructions were, what her, success, her um, recommended therapies were, got with them, got with some contacts in the hospital, and we took her to the hospital. She spent six days in inpatient hospital. She then spent 11 days in a skilled nursing facility, all started by our community paramedic, Mike Smith. Um, and then after the discharge, after 11 days from skilled nursing, she came home and started with home care that we were able to set up two to three hours a day. That wasn't enough. She was still having trouble. So we were able to get her 24-hour patient care, seven days a week. She's receiving regular occupational and physical therapy. And we actually just got an update from her and her family today, and she dropped off. She dropped off a really nice card for us. She's home. Her family's never been more involved. She, um, she, she's a much healthier, happier person. And uh, it's been a really positive experience. Um, some of the other things, as you know, we're going through our hiring process, filling a vacancy from Captain Hafey. I spoke to him, and he's doing really well at Hamilton Township. He, he mentioned all the all the, the 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 training and experiences he's had here, and how he's he's been really set up to be a successful leader in Hamilton Township. So, as you know, he's been here a long time, and the opportunities this city provided him obviously gave him the tools he needed to step up and lead, lead another department, which is, which is very exciting for us. Um, we're working on filling our fire med medic vacancy. We've got a, uh, 
a very large amount of qualified candidates. I will tell you, there's two or three departments in Central Ohio that are hiring, so it is a race to get the, the cream of the crop, and it's a race to get these, the, the, these qualified candidates, because there's not an overabundance of these candidates anymore. Um, the, the amount of people that are ready to go to work, that have their paramedic certification, that have their professional fire certification, they're far limited now, so it, it really is a competition to, uh, to lure these candidates in. We're working really hard at that. So we're hoping to do uh, some interviews this week, um, and I'll hopefully be reporting back to you soon after a successful process there. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions or, or any comments or anything anybody has for me. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. You as well. All right, next we have the police department. Save the best for last, right? <laughs> we have a friendly competition. Uh, like him, I'm also glad to have some sense of normalcy back uh, to in person meetings. I think it's great to to actually be here and see everybody as opposed to looking at a laptop. Uh, my report has been forwarded. I'm welcome to take any questions or comments on that. Uh, just a couple things. Um, like Chief Eisenhacker, we are also in our hiring process as well. Uh, we have a few candidates that we're looking at. We're in the final stages of that. Um, our reports are back to uh, 2019 levels, essentially. Uh, so we are also coming out of that, that COVID time frame. Uh, with interactions with our police officers. Uh, so other than that, uh, it's business as usual in the police department. So I'm welcome to take any, any questions or comments. I have a question. Um, this is somewhat in self-interest, I will admit. But so I was reading through your report, and I was looking in particular at some instances of bike theft, one of which belonged to my son. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, on Saturday, during the garage sales, there was a call made to police that there was a pickup truck and a trailer attached to it full of bicycles that were for sale. My son's bike was on there. It was recovered. But I was curious if there was any follow-up with that because in the meantime, between my son's bike being stolen and it being recovered, I called and Officer Diaz came out to her house because the somewhat suspicious person had approached my son in the alley outside her house, noticed his bike he happens to have to. Hey, that's a nice bike. Would you be looking to buy another one? And this was an adult. Officer Diaz came out and spoke with us and said they actually knew who the person was and they were kind of out looking for him. I was curious if those two things are related or if you have any information about that. I don't have anything in front of me related to that. Uh, I would say I'm glad that we were able to get the bike back. Yeah. Um, but that's typically, as we get into the warmer months, we're going to see an increase in bicycle thefts. I know that this month is bicycle you know, awareness pretty much. We're running a campaign right now to, to really try and get people to register their bikes on the city website with our program. And I believe it's the first 25 will get a, a, a nice bike lock from, from the police department to try and encourage that. Uh, but as far as the relation between you know, the, those thefts and the individual that you're talking about, I don't have that information in front of me, but I can definitely look into it. I appreciate that, thanks. Obviously, it won't kick anybody off. If anybody can really register it, but it's mainly focused towards the residents here in our area.
finance meeting in mid-May, um, just learned, um, Director Miller mentioned this in her finance report, that uh, the guidelines and regulations and uh, how the money can be spent, $1.6 million dollars with the Recovery Act, uh, won't be coming out until, coming out until June, so uh, in light of that, rather than mid, rather than around the mid of, middle of May, I'm going to have this uh, finance meeting in the middle of, some, somewhere in the middle of June, so. Thank you. Uh, planning and administration. Recreation Services and Public Facilities. Uh, Parks and Rec Committee met this evening prior to our regular meeting, covered one item of business that is on our agenda this evening. I'd be happy to address questions at that time. Yes, can you all hear me? Yes. All right, we met this evening at 6 p.m. for an educational meeting on the public health and environmental risks of coal tar and high speed PAH driveway and parking lot surveillance. We heard from guest speakers Brian Will of Sustainable Grand View and then Tom, Tom Ennis of Coal Tar Free America. And um, folks can listen in to the recording. It was a Zoom virtual meeting um, to get up to speed on that topic. I also, while I have the floor, I want to note that I have gotten um, a text message from our community members saying that the meeting is not live streaming right now. So I just wanted to flag that for um, Director Lee as a heads up. Thanks, Melanie. We did not post it that it would be live stream. That was something we were trying to do since this was our first Okay. So it, it's okay. been recorded and will be posted and we're going to keep working on getting the live stream working. Okay. Thank you for that. No. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on, economic development. No meeting, no report. Thank you. Rules and productivity. No meeting, no report. Thank you. Maybe library, no report. Outreach to further the rapid 
initiative, which we've heard about earlier in the evening. And then I know Mercy also supported the administration uh, putting together a um, uh, congressional earmark uh, request, and I will, I'm sure the mayor will be covering that later. Thank you. Destination review? Yes. Um, Mr. Cheek informed me, I think they put a grant in for something to do with some advertising in Columbus Crew Stadium to do one, but um, that is quite pricey, they have learned, so I think they withdrew that. Uh, grant requests, they are going to likely come up with another one. They're also going to look to uh, try to interact more with the Columbus crew fans in general and also waiting for the crew to have some more smaller, manageable sponsorship and advertisement opportunities that they think will arise as the new stadium opens and so on and so forth. <coughs> so the next meeting is uh, next week, I think it's next Friday. Um, so we'll get it. And he does a great job, by the way, of keeping me updated on what's going on. If there's ever anyone who ever, ever, any time anyone has any questions about that, he's very accessible and where I can answer the questions for you. So that's all. Thank you. Moving on to Sandville 2015. No report this month. They meet again in June. I'll come back and report to you guys in mid-June or July. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Um, May is a busy month. We are uh, very excited that we will be able to honor our veterans this year in person again at the Blue Star Brothers Memorial Ceremony on Thursday. We are also uh, equally excited that we will be holding the parade on Saturday morning as we have in the past. So look for an announcement this week about that. Um, certainly we've been working with uh, GBSA and others on particularly GBSA on the first pitch arrangements, if that is to happen or not, that's under review right now. But uh, very excited to get, get our normal summer kickoff back, uh, as well as the pool opening the same day. Um, it's spring cleanup week. Um, everybody put successful garage sale and uh, saw a lot of things out on the curb. Um, and just a reminder that we do bulk pick, pick up any time, but this is a particularly good week to do it if you have them, um, if you have those items. Friday was Arbor Day. Uh, we um, are celebrating our 37th year as a Tree City USA. We planted a redbud tree down at Pierce Field with some third graders. Thank you to Kids at Compost for holding the Earth Day event uh, compost giveaway so people can see how their uh, food waste gets recycled and utilized for the earth. And that was a very successful event. The street program is just now getting underway. We uh, will have more information coming soon about uh, where that's going to be in the community. Columbia Gas Project over on the east side, particularly uh, down by Burr Avenue. Work has started, that is um, actually phase two, and uh, you may see flaggers and equipment. Please exercise caution in the area. And finally, it's Public Service Recognition Week. We appreciate all of our staff. Uh, we love our staff. We thank them for the service they give to the community every day of the year, but this week is a special recognition. Any questions, happy to take them. Any questions for Mayor Green? Great, we got a director of operations. Director uh, Thank you. Past month, the administration's been working on supporting all the various departments on, on moving various projects forward, so we're excited about all the parks and rec activities, particularly the rec programs coming up and the various camps that we have. Uh, parks maintenance, it's difficult to keep up with the grass burning these days, but I did notice this morning the flowers are coming up at City Hall and trying to beautify the city and uh, various entrance points and the parks and so forth. So a lot going on there. A lot going on uh, both above ground and underground. The administration attends meetings on water lines, the sewers, the um, uh, various developments on sheets projects, and we just pretty much you do a lap around the city and we have a, a project going on in, in every corner that requires, um, you know, our input. And basically we're doing anything we can as an administration of moving forward the city's number one identified project, which is about you know, being a municipal campus. So, I don't want to steal any of Liz's thunder on some of the good things we've been doing. Yeah. We spoke about the 
both time consuming and rewarding. So I think we've got a good month. Um, Maybe we'll know some information by then, but then it could still be delayed a little bit. So we're just waiting to hear from that. We have been collecting, the administration's been collecting project ideas from all the departments, and if nothing else, that's gonna help us beef up our capital plan. So we've been doing a lot of planning in that way. The other big finance news is the municipal income tax. I mentioned in my report, the Buckeye Institute had filed a few different lawsuits. One of them was against the city of Columbus regarding work from home. That one was dismissed, which was a great win for all of us. They then subsequently appealed, which the tax guys like to point out to me not to get too excited. So it's now been appealed, but it is good news for us. Um, there is a substituted house bill out there that's also regarding income tax, municipal income tax, and the work from home. So there's really a lot going on as far as that in the legislature and even in the courts. So we just keep watching it and I'll keep updating you on all of that. Other than that, I don't have anything else. Are there any questions for Dr. Thank you. Moving on, Director Planning Committee. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Bob was mentioning, there is a, a lot of exciting stuff going on um, that I have been really enjoying being able to be part of. Just to highlight a few things from the uh, from my council report, um, the uh, I listened in on a presentation about the Upper Arlington Community Center actually, and would occur, encourage anybody who hasn't gone on, online to learn a little bit more about that to do so. It will be uh, available by membership to really anybody in the in the region um, who wants to drive to it and being close to us feels like at least to me feels like it um, if it passes and gets built would be a great um, amenity to our tribal area here. Uh, the schools K twelve or sorry four twelve campus um, we've gotten through kind of preliminary um, planning with regard to that and are in the process right now of holding public meetings to gain input and perspective on anything we may have missed and to share those plans with the community. Um, uh, was you know thrilled to be able to, to work uh, directly with the mayor to um, get all the information that we needed to get in for the, the earmark that was offered to us and hopefully um, we will be seeing some, some revenue come in that will help fund that project. Been very busy with the new municipal building planning. Um, we're getting close to having a recommendation for uh, being able to move forward with the preferred um, architectural uh, planning partner. We had interviews in April um, and learned a lot of good things. My favorite part about interviews is that they throw out all kinds of good ideas that you can take from everybody that you talk to, so that was nice um, to, to hear some of that. We've also been looking at wraparound projects related to that project. Um, things like needing to move uh, some of the vehicles that are stored down here to another location. So starting to really try to get our arms around the entirety um, of what will be required. A couple smaller initiatives ongoing. Um, one is I have uh, gotten into the zoning code enough now to have an idea of how to actually move it forward. So we've started the substantive part of um, preparing uh, some documents to begin to um, look at uh, some things that might be able to be updated there. Um, and also cell teller, cell, small cell legislation, we're studying that and how many um, cells might be needed in the city. Actually, we did a coverage study and there will be some that will be needed in the city. Uh, I, I originally was hoping we could just keep them on our, on our perimeter, but uh, to get the coverage, there will be some. So we're working on design guidelines for those, not only legislation, but also design guidelines. So where they go off, they would look good. Um, thrilled to be able to be participating in the Rapid Five stakeholder meetings. If you all have any input, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to talk with you about any of that and carry that forward to the, the planning team. Um, some of you walk, who do walking around the community may have noticed uh, that there's some rain gardens that are on our perimeter in the city of Columbus. 
um, that are being planned, and we are in conversations with the city of Columbus um, to make sure that some of the details of us get installed uh, work as well as they can for our community as well. Uh, I participated in the Tri Village Chamber Partnership Economic Development Download last week, maybe the week before, which was a really good sharing event across all of the jurisdictions who are part of that organization. Um, it has generated some follow-up interest, uh, to, like uh, as much as we can advertise that we're open for business and that we're ready to have additional businesses located here, the better off. So working on getting you know additional exposure for the city in that regard. And then just a couple other quick things: the uh, Grandview Crossing. Um, is getting closer to uh, operationalizing. It will be this fall, and so we're following up with them to make sure that that um, operationalization goes smoothly. There's new lights, there'll be new service, police and fire service required there, and, uh, and they still need some approvals through planning commission, so we're in conversations with them to get all of that completed. And then last, um, I have also been studying the, with regard to Clinton Township, um, as a partner with them on studying the um, ongoing initiatives in the region that will impact and maybe provide opportunities for growth, economic development, and additional planning uh, for Clinton Township. And so um, I'm looking at all of those and, and starting to think about how we might queue up a, a planning engagement for them that will help them really take advantage, particularly West Clinton Township is very close, close to the Ohio State University's Innovation District that was just recently announced and has potential for really benefit from that as well as its location proximate to the Rapid 5 improvement scan or plus four or uh, plus rapid transit initiatives. So uh, it's definitely an opportunity there to help improve the region um, as part of the township. So I'm having a good time and appreciate all the uh, opportunities. Happy to answer any questions. Just for viewers who might be watching or the audience, why Clinton Township is important to you guys? Clinton Town, we are a Gen Z Joint Economic Development Zone partner with Clinton Township. We help them collect uh, income tax to help fund their operations and uh, in turn provide supportive services with regard to those collections as well as some planning services to help support them, which helps support the region. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Um, is there any update on the, uh, the, the federal grant, the uh, Fairview Avenue area with, uh, you know, we got emails last week uh, regarding uh, Representative uh, Congressman Bailey's office. Is there any update on that? Um, we, so the update I would offer is that we were able to um, pull it together in, in 24 hours uh, and really have to commend the mayor, frankly, um, the amount of initiative to corral all the different information and people and documents that were needed um, in a very, very short period of time uh, was great. Um, there was, uh, so we, we were able to submit essentially for the bike and pedestrian components and the intersection control components of that um, uh, investment opportunity there. Uh, and what we heard from the uh, the Congresswoman's office was that the total amount of all of the projects they were putting forward was within the budget of what they were expected to be available, and so very optimistic that that grant funding would be approved as long as it makes its way all, all the way through Congress. There's no other um, approvals per se. It's been recommended, and so as long as there's not a, a reduction in the program overall, it wouldn't be singled out as something that wouldn't be funded, so fairly optimistic there. Um, yeah, and then we'll still be able to put forward the road, the road bed for OPWC funding in the fall. And actually, if we were able to get that earmark, it would help with that grant funding as well. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Um, about the uh, Rapid 5 project and the community engagement piece that Neighborhood Design Center is doing, yeah. um, she may have, uh, Lisa may have said it, um, but how do residents get involved in that? Is that just by going to the Rapid 5 kind of web page and looking for an event, or is that something that we can also kind of promote to folks to sort of plug into? All of the above, yes. I believe that the, the community input portion starts either Friday or Monday. Um, so right now they're meeting with all the constituent and stakeholder groups, uh, cities and townships, and, and those sorts of folks that touch all of these corridors. Um, and then they'll be opening it for public comment very shortly. The, um, there are some, uh, materials available if we wanted to share
share that on social media or share with the school system um, or share with your friends uh, uh, to get the you know the widest input possible um, into that initiative and I think uh, the stakeholder group that I was um, a part of last week conversations there they're really looking very 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 broad so any input that will it's very open all right so any input will help enrich uh, the outcome there's a lot of opportunity there so I, I can send you some documentation if you'd like Thank you. Just a quick follow up. Is, is the um, is the engagement uh, geographically focused? I know that there are different corridors uh, that are associated with that. Is there a specific engagement with the corridor uh, piece that we that where we where we are? Yes. Uh, so there are. We we happen to touch two of the five rivers. So we are engaged both both with the Sayada initiative as well as with the Olentangy initiative. Um, and I suspect, I'm not sure if the online, you know, how that is constrained or if you're able, to, as a community member, able to offer input into all five programs. I really don't know that off the top of my head. Um, but for Grandview Heights, we've been, we've been pulled in on the two that we touch. Um, and they're, they're doing kind of brainstorming sessions with um, you know, a wide variety of constituents right now, looking, uh, trying to develop goals, not strategies or tasks, but just uh, Resolution. 
motion. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I'll second. Yes, motion is second. Clerk, please call the roll. Edwards? Yes. Hasty? Yep. Hudson Patino? <coughs> yes. Houston? Yes. Cancera? Yes. Smith? Yes. President Keeler? Yes. Resolution 06-2021 has been approved. Resolution 07-2021, a resolution adopting a tax budget for fiscal year 2022. Yeah, th again, this is another basically house uh, keeping measure. We do this um, annually. It's uh, just uh, we need to uh, present the tax budget. Um, and Director Miller, if you want to elaborate more, go ahead. This is where we we give rough estimates of what we think we're going to receive, what we think we're going to spend to show the county that we need them to levy our real estate taxes. So again, it's kind of a formality, um, and we're required to have a public hearing, which I think we're going to have at the first meeting in June. Is there a motion? I move to approve. Uh, we have to have our tax public meeting. budget hearing first. Oh, we have that. Okay. 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 Second. 
think correctly is called a roll. That's the Patinos? Yes. Houston. What's that name? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And Sarah? Yes. Smith? Yes. Edwards? Yes. Hasty? Yep. President Keeler? Yes. Resolution 09 2021 has been approved. Thank you. Moving on to new business item number five. Ordinance 2021-10, an ordinance to amend the salary ordinance, ordinance of the City of Grandview Heights, Ohio, and declaring it an emergency. Thank you. Mayor Kearns, would you like to speak on this legislation? Thank you, Madam President. Um, both of these necessitated by the changing needs of the city. Uh, the first one, the comm center dispatch supervisor, or dispatch, uh, the name of it? Thank you. Um, was in the budget last year. Uh, if you recall, we've got obviously 24-7 coverage every day of the year there. It is something that um, is partially handled by part-time employees. Uh, it is uh, staffing is necessary and can be difficult. Um, and, and it really is a model that has, you know, there's some, I think, challenges with people getting burned out when they're being asked to work all the time. And uh, those are difficult shifts. So we have proposed to solve that with this position. This was something that we discussed during the budget and it is also in conjunction with um, the need for expanded information processing with respect to data. Um, came with the body camera rollout and so that is the first position. Uh, we do expect somebody, uh, we, what, what, what this position will do is allow, first of all, this, uh, the sergeant to develop more duties to being a sergeant and less to supervising the comm center and secondly provide someone really to be kind of a point person for that type of information processing. Um, second position is necessitated by um, uh, somewhat of a surprise but we wish him well uh, Captain Hafey leaving. Uh, he was essentially the fourth captain serving as a staff captain. Uh, we have done a review in conjunction with the fire chief and really a chain of command is needed, a second in command is needed there. So at the end of this will be three captains, assistant chief and chief, and that kind of structure. Great, thank you. Um, and I have to note, um, you were all emailed a corrected version today. Um, so I would move to, uh, move to version 0503-2020. Yes, the substitution. Thank you. Summary for the substitution. Clerk, please call the roll. Houston? Yeah. And Sarah? Yes. Smith? Yes. Edwards? Yes. Hasty? Yes. Texas Patinos? Yes. President Keeler? Yes. Ordinance 2021 10 has been substituted. Yeah, I will go ahead and assign that to uh, finance and we record that as first reading. Moving on, we have other business. I believe we have one item. Correct, it is a return permit for. Just being on a cautious 
website to pr protect you all. Um, and then secondly, a very brief update for the year of racial justice learning work group. We're excited to announce a three-part uh, MET series for the summer, which will be Safe Conversations About Race on June 17th at 7 p.m. Understanding Inequality in Metropolitan Neighbors on July 8th at 7 p.m. And the impact of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre on August 26th at 7 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Yeah, thank you. Um, I, don't, I know this one probably isn't on video, but if there is any public listening, um, you know, I try very hard. I think actually a lot of people on council do try very hard to respond to citizens' complaints. Um, I've had multiple conversations in my prior life on council with Ms. Kozak afterwards. And, I actually went through the emails. I've only been here since February, back since February, I believe, of uh, last year, but I think she addressed five or six issues. Um, I believe all of them were responded to or we discussed. So um, now that sometimes I think there's, there might be a perception that someone brings something up and we discuss it and we didn't respond to them directly. I'm not sure from some of this or if she's, I mean, not, not, she was up here talking about it, saying she doesn't get responsive and not pick it right way. It's just very pleasant for me to deal with everything. But, um, so I don't know if there was, you know, I encourage people to respond back to, the, uh, to the citizens. I know sometimes we get into council and we all, you know, we said, okay, so who is responding to this or we think someone else is? But, um, you know, my phone number is 614-940-5003. I, I, I constituents call me all the time and I'm not just saying like friends of mine. So I encourage everybody to do that and I am willing to, Discuss a different way of you know, public comment. Um, we've been doing the public comment at the beginning. Um, I, I always thought it was someone out of respect for the people, you know, they don't have to sit through all meeting and comment on something if they want to. But um, I'm willing to revisit that. But since I've been on council on and off for the past, I think it's 14 years, some, you know, some years in there, I wasn't on, but we've always done it this way. It doesn't mean it's right, but I don't think anything's changed ever. Decided to put it this on the front of the package. I mean, maybe people haven't seen it written like that before. But again, to the public out there, I do read every single email. Um, I even remember with one of the planning commission things, I, when they were doing the form emails out to us, I responded individually to about 50 or 60 of those people. I knew a lot of them, so I tried to do that. And I thought it was important to do so. I think a lot of you guys feel the same way. So if it's a perception that, that we don't do it, or maybe I'm not getting the personal stuff in and this was before when we weren't having comments during the online meetings sometimes people send us stuff and I wasn't clear if it was meant to be a comment or for a council meeting or just something for us to consider and so um, I think that now we have live meetings because I know when people come in here it's very obvious what they want so let's try to be more cognizant of that um, again my number is 614-940-5003 I actually answer the phone more for people whose numbers I don't know. I'm probably the only one in the room who does that, so because it could be a good client, you know. So please, <laughs> until I know you, then I don't want to take your calls. I'll put your name in the mic anymore. Ed, I, I would echo your comments. Um, I'm also more of a phone person, and uh, I would I would take the steps to reassure everyone that does email counsel or emails me, and I'm sure this is uh, going to be consistent with all of us that those emails have read. I think there is, uh, I, I think there is a distinct misunderstanding that is made by a sender of an email if they do not get a reply that's consistent with what their desire is, and um, that's unfortunate. I think that it's reflective of a little bit of the kind of polarized nature of our civic involvement and of uh, um, federal issues, local issues, etc. And um, you know it's it's difficult sometimes to have conversations via email that are intended to portray uh, a, a, um, a non. It, it, let's put it this way: it's easy to misread an email response and interpret it as a, uh, uh, a, a 
something that it wasn't intended to, to me. So my preference is also to speak by phone or in person, um, and I, I would echo the, uh, uh, the, the consistent response, uh, I'm sorry, the consistent practice that we have to read those emails and take them into consideration in, in all of our deliberations. Thank you. Um, I would point out these, the, what was published in the agenda is nothing new. It's been on a request for the board form that's been the same as long as I've seen it, which is since before I was on council. Um, and it is part of the rules of council, so as we are holding our rules and productivity committee uh, meetings, perhaps that's something that the committee could look at and take into consideration. Uh, I know myself, I always make a point to respond to anybody who emails me. You walk by my house, you can sit on my porch. Uh, I'm always happy to talk to anyone about any topics that might come up. Uh, some other things I would like to say thank you to all of our staff members. Um, as it is thank you week, but also we had a wonderfully, wonderfully hard year 